in the last video, we left off where Muhammad smashed the idols of the Kaaba so that people would turn their attention to a single, all-powerful, true God. Another effect of Muhammad's action is that by smashing the idol, the idols, there's 360 of them, um, each individual tribe had their own, and so by smashing all of them, he was asserting a single, all-powerful God that does not distinguish between different tribes. He set up a great potential for political unification, as well as religious unification, ultimately leading to the potential for the rapid growth of Islam across a vast range of territories and people. By the time of his death in 632, Muhammad hadn't designated a successor to manage the affairs of the Muslims. It could be a big problem when he dies and there's no one left to take over. A small group of Muslims believe the position of caliph or its successor to Muhammad should go to Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, Ali ibn Abu Talib. Ali was married to Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. However, after some debate in the shura, or council, it was decided that Ali lacked the experience necessary to lead the Islamic community, the Ummah. Instead, Muhammad's close companion and one of the first converts to Islam, Abu Bakr, was chosen. Abu Bakr is considered the first of four rightly guided caliphs who succeeded Muhammad. Muslim spread, Muslim rule spreads. The Muslims originally intended only to raid their neighbors and return home, as was Arab custom, but their welcomed reception and swift victories encouraged them to move forward. They soon became an imperial power, conquering territory, much like the Romans and others had, do, for, for, do, had been doing for centuries. Decades of war between the Persians and Romans had taken a toll on the population and had weakened the central governments and armies of both empires. Bedouin forces that had migrated north eagerly joined the Bedouin armies from Arabia, Arabia in hopes of amassing war spoils and rising above their station as vassals of the Byzantine and Persian Empire. Although the expansion of Islam was driven by religious motives, mass conversion was not initially encouraged. First, because the face of the people of the book, that's the Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, and Muslims, were considered the predecessors to Islam and protected under Islamic law. And second, because the tax collected from non-Muslims helped fund the emerging state in his expeditions. So they wouldn't really want to convert you because they need money from you. If you're a Muslim, you don't pay the tax. You see here the spread of Islam out of Arabia. First they unite the Arabian Peninsula, then they move out and spread. Only two years after his election as caliph, Abu Bakr died and was replaced by Umar ibn al-Khattab. The Muslim empire grew rapidly under the direction of the second rightly guided caliph. He's going to be in charge for about 10 years. We see in our map, Islam continues to spread. Now it's all over North Africa, Southern Europe, Outside of Arabia, the invading Arabs allowed Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians to freely practice their own faiths and manage their own communities. Initially, no effort was made to convert the Christian and Jewish population to Islam, but voluntary conversion took place on a mass scale for a number of reasons. Islam's recognition of Jewish and Christian prophets like Jesus, Moses, Abraham, made the new faith more accessible. Muslims were exempt from paying a poll tax, 
Conversion simply required a proclamation that Allah was the only God and that Muhammad was his last prophet. And all Muslims were considered equal under God, an appealing concept to impoverished and underprivileged converts. Along with the spread of Islam, the arrival of the Arab armies in the area introduced the Arabic language, which quickly replaced Greek, Aramaic, and Coptic as the common languages in the region. In order to govern the new territories, Umar divided the conquered countries into provinces and appointed governors from the powerful Umayyad family to manage the land. Umar also established a public treasury, a public police department, a judicial system, and was separate from the exec executive branch of government. He built schools and instituted governmental distribution of stipends to the poor, including the Jews and Christians. And we see how much more land the Umayyad dynasty covered. All North Africa now, all the way over into England, where the Byzantine Empire had once been. The Muslims are now at the gates of Constantinople, you can see here, in Anatolia. And they don't stop there. It continues to spread, uh, going in past the Byzantine Empire. Yes, they conquered the Byzantines into Greece, southern Russia, most of India. And if you look to the far right on the map, we see they're in uh, the Pacific Rim, the Philippines, and other islands that Europeans would uh, colonize much later. Abu Bakr's armies invaded Syria in 633 and captured Damascus two years later, making it a center of Muslim rule in the region. The loss of Damascus prompted the Byzantine Empire to send 200,000 um, strong army to the region, forcing the Muslims to retreat to the Yarmouk River. A month later, the Byzantine army and 30,000 Muslims engaged in battles in the valley of the Yarmouk River. The Muslim force had less than half the number of fighters than the Imperial Byzantine Army, but the troops were more unified and emboldened by their belief that they were fighting in the name of a god. The Byzantine Army, by contrast, comprised of Christian Slavs, Armenians, Greeks, Gessanid Arabs, thousands of whom would eventually join the Muslim side. Many of the Byzantine subjects, especially the Jews and Christians, belonged to sects considered heretical and persecuted by the Orthodox Byzantines. So they weren't very happy to be fighting for the Byzantines. The watershed six-day battle of Yarmouk ended with the decisive defeat of the Byzantine army and opened Syria and Palestine to Muslim rule. Within a month, the Muslims had taken Damascus and shortly thereafter entered Jerusalem. You can see where those cities are on the map here. This is Byzantium losing control of the whole Middle East. Umar and Jerusalem. When Umar, the second caliph, received word that Jerusalem was ready to give in to the Muslim forces in 638, he entered the city himself to accept the surrender. Once in the holy city, Umar proceeded to search for the rock upon which Muhammad had prayed during his night journey and ordered that no prayers be made at that spot until the area was cleansed by three rainfalls. Umar assured the inhabitants that their lives would be safe and that they would have complete security for their property and their churches. He also promised the people of Jerusalem that nothing good would befall them. Nothing but good would befall them as long as they paid the poll tax and obeyed the law. The Muslim conquest of Egypt proceeded rapidly 
due to the support of the Egyptian Christian Coptics, who resented Byzantine efforts to impose their own Orthodox version of Christianity. Egypt's capital city, Alexandria, fell to the Muslims in 638. In 641, the Catholic bishop invited them to help free Egypt from its Roman rulers. In the same year, a Muslim commander founded the garrison town of Fustat, meaning camp, on the east bank of the Nile, near present-day Cairo. Here, the first mosque in Africa was built, and a canal between the Nile River and the town of Suez, commissioned by the Egyptian leader in 610, was restored the next year, allowing the Arabs to transport goods from the east to west. From their base in Fustat, the Muslim armies advanced across North Africa, creating Islamic provinces comprising what are today Western Libya, Tunisia, Eastern Algeria. The name Ifrika was used for this region, these provinces, and it's the Arabic version of Africa, the name of a province in the once vast Roman Empire. Muslim victories over the Mesopotamia, present-day Iraq, and parts of Persia led to the fall of the Sassanid Empire. The Romans couldn't do it. They spent hundreds of years fighting them. And here come the Muslims, and they knock them right out. The Muslims took the Sassanid capital of Sestfan in 637 and soundly defeated the Sassanids in 642. Generally, the native population of Persia welcomed the egalitarian, tolerant Arabs over the class-conscious, bankrupt, Sassanid rulers, although mass conversions to Islam didn't take place until the 9th century. The elite adopted the Arabic language, however, while most of the population continued to speak Persian, as they do today. Umar was killed in 644 by a Persian slave. He was succeeded by the third rightly guided caliph, Pius Uthman ibn Affan, from the Uth Umayyad clan. Despite objections from a small group of believers who thought that Ali, Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, was Muhammad's rightful successor, Uthman incorporated a number of new territories into the Muslim empire, including Armenia, Caucasia, Cyprus, and much of North Africa. Uthman was also responsible for collecting the verses that had been sent from God through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad in order to create an official authoritative version of the Quran in 650 CE. Until that point, the words that came from the prophet's mouth had been diligently memorized by the group of scholars called the Quran, or Quran readers. The verses had been written on scraps of leather or bits of bone or palm leaves. Uthman wanted to ensure that all copies of the Quran were in the proper sequence and that pronunciation would be uniform. Despite his accomplishments, Uthman became unpopular due to changes of corruption and nepotism, having promoted, among others, his relative Muawiyah, the son of Muhammad's adversary, to a higher office. Uthman, like his predecessor, was assassinated in 656 by a group of army mutineers from Egypt. Uthman's death finally brought the appointment of Ali as the Muslim community's fourth rightly guided caliph. One of the new caliph's first calls of action was to clean up the corrupt administration that he had inherited from his predecessor by ordering some governors to step down. However, one of these governors, Moaya al-Sofani, refused to vacate his post, opting instead to lead an insurrection against Ali's authority. In a scene filled with intrigue and conspiracy, Following Mahawaya's bid for the caliphate, 
and calls for vengeance against Uthman's killers. Plots were devised to murder both the governor and Ali. While Muali escaped his death, Ali did not. He was assassinated in the city of Najaf in present-day Iraq in 661. His son was proclaimed caliph, but was immediately challenged by Muawiyah. Rather than fight the contender and instigating a civil war, Ali's son abdicated in favor of Muawiyah. The Umayyads. What a big empire. Wow. They claimed control over the Muslim empire as caliph. Uh, Muawiyah claimed control over the Muslim empire as caliph in 661, ushering in the Umayyad dynasty and moving the capital from the empire of Medina to Damascus, Syria. So he's kind of in the middle of the entire empire. That's where Damascus would be. With the center of the empire shifted to the Levant, the region on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, that includes present-day Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and Egypt, incursions to the west through the Mediterranean Sea were much easier to accomplish. The empire thus formally expanded to North Africa and Spain, and Arabic was declared the state language in all the conquered areas. The Umayyads launched a new wave of invasions east of the Indus River, bringing Central Asia into the Islamic fold. With its expansion, the Muslim empire revived trade along the Silk Road, stimulating a transcontinental trading system that stretched from the Far East to Europe. Muayyah was succeeded as caliph by his son, the first time the position was passed through the bloodline. The caliphate under the Umayyads began to resemble an empire or kingdom ruled by hereditary emperor, emperors like those heading the Byzantine or Persian empires that they had overthrown. To commemorate Muhammad's night journey from the site of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem and to establish political authority in Palestine, bolstering their claim to inherit the region, the Umayyads completed work on the Dome of the Rock in 693, a grand monument replacing the wooden structure placed there by the Umar after the Muslims entered Jerusalem in 637. The Dome of the Rock was built over the platform from which Muhammad is believed to have mounted a winged steed and accompanied by the angel Gabriel, was given a glimpse of paradise. In 715, the Umayyads also built the al Osk, or farthest mosque, near the dome to serve as a meeting place for pilgrims from Muslim lands. The city of Jerusalem is still the third holiest destination for Muslims, after the cities of Mecca and Medina and the first holiest city for to Jews who come to visit the Western or Wailing Wall, the only remaining structure from the Temple of Solomon. The structure is currently cared for by a Muslim administrative body in Jerusalem, the Waqf. As the Muslim population grew, mosques sprang up across the empire, towering over all other non-Islamic holy structures taller than churches from the Christians, synagogues from the Jews, and other religious minorities were prohibited from building churches or temples higher than mosques. There's some discussion questions for today's lesson.